I'm sorry, we're in the book of Matthew. I'm going to be reading out of John a lot today. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. For those of you who are new, we're just standing out of Jesus' teaching segment here. Here's the segment we're covering today. Jesus called his 12 disciples together. And he gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Here are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also called Peter. And Andrew, Peter's brother. James, son of Zebedee, John, James's brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector. James, it's interesting, Matthew is writing this. A tax collector was considered the lowest of the low, just evil. And Matthew includes that about himself. It's interesting how he put the tax collector in there just as another slap in his own face to stay humble, to be so grateful for Jesus. I don't know why he did it, but he didn't have to. says a lot about his character. Then there's James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. And then it says, Jesus sent out the twelve apostles with these instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. Now remember, the old covenant is still in effect here. The new covenant doesn't start in until Jesus raises from the dead and they begin to reach all people, Gentiles, Jews, everybody. And he says to them, go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, cast out demons, give as freely as you have received. Don't take any money in your money belts, no gold, silver, copper coins. Don't carry a traveler's bag with a change of clothes and sandals or even a walking stick. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve to be fed. Let's pray and we'll talk about this. Father in heaven, we love you. I thank you again that we as your church are gathered inside these walls. Lord, help each one of us be able to pause and clear out our heads, our hearts right now. Not be thinking about anything else going on except meeting you here. You are our audience. We're not up here. I'm not up here doing a performance, Lord. It's, it's just for you. And may you do your thing amongst each one of us, and may we be better because of our time together. Help us to be able to identify with one or two of these apostles that we're going to look at and be able to walk out with a challenge, something that we can say, thank you, God, for such a great change in my life, and something that we need to change ourselves and work on so that we may honor you more and more and be an impact in this world for you. Jesus, it's all in your name. We love you. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. You know, I was thinking the other day, it's so easy the way uh, that this setup is. Somebody sent me a video of a preacher doing this. I thought about just showing the clip. I hadn't thought about this in a long time. I thought about it before. It's so easy in this setup where we have the lights and we have the stage and we've got the screens. Who's the audience when we gather together? The way the setup is, it seems to identify or show that you are the audience and we're the performers, which makes it so easy for you as the audience if we're not careful. Or even me when I'm sitting out there and Jordan's up here communicating or Keith's communicating, it's so easy to get into that. I'm observing, I'm out in the audience, this is done for me, but that's not what it is. We're not the performers and you're not the audience. We are here together using our strengths and giftedness in a different way and God's our audience. Keith, myself, Jordan, we're not here to entertain, you know, and I don't feel that from you. I just, it's just a good reminder that it's so simple sometimes to sit out in, in here in the crowd and think a performance or something's going on and it makes it real easy to want to be critical. I'll sit over there sometimes and I have a critical mind always thinking about how we can make something better or sharper. And it's so easy to get caught up in those distractions. We've got to remember, when we show up here together, there's no performance going on in front of an audience. This is you and I together, coming together as the body, and Jesus, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are our audience, and we are here to be challenged and to meet them. That's the only reason we're here together. There's no performance going on. And it just was so good for me to be reminded of that. Otherwise, we can get so caught up into the pleasing of people, or I come here expecting what I want or what I need, when the reality is we are here to meet the Lord. And I pray that our time together, as short as it is, even when the preacher goes along, it's still short. And we walk out those doors and we go into a week of crazy chaos, but beautiful weather, albeit for now. Yes, we finally, I think we hopefully have chased summer out of here. So I just want to pause and remind us of that. When I look at this passage, let's get to this. 
again, as we're going through every teaching and command of Jesus, I'm coming across some that are like, hey, we've talked about that. I mean, we've talked about evil spirits. We've talked about disease and illness and healing. We've talked about uh, how you go out and be an impact in society. But what we haven't talked about as I look at this passage is the 12 apostles. So today's a little bit different than one of my typical. I went and I looked on Google and found what I thought was maybe a cool picture that some artist rendition. We don't know how these guys looked. You know, we have no idea. Uh, they look probably in these images way too English. That's where art originated from when it comes to some of this and some of the pictures that I've, that I've dug up here. Uh, most of the apostles would have been extremely dark-skinned. You know, Jewish men of, of, a, of the Palestinian era out there, very Arab in their look and, and anyway. So I want to talk about these guys. And let's just start with this. A little bit of a studio. Sit back, relax. And what I want of us this morning is to identify. Maybe you will identify with one of these guys. And just maybe let God work on you as you think about this person and as you think about our founding fathers of the faith, if you will, who were taught directly by the Lord himself, spent three years with him, watched him be crucified, raised from the dead. And they literally, once he raised from the dead, scattered all around to the, the, the world, the known world, hungry to take the good news of forgiveness. The Messiah had arrived. The price of sin had been paid, and they literally took it to the ends of the earth. So let's get started on these guys. Let's start with, and we're just going to do them in the order they were in the Bible there that we just read. The Apostle Andrew, if you look at some of his, uh, let's see if I do this. Oh, I don't have this in front of me. Will this work if I click it again? Yes. All right. I'm figuring out my technology myself. There's some bullet points for each one of these guys. The Apostle Andrew, he was a JTB disciple. Who's that? Anybody figure it out? John the Baptist, disciple. So this says something about Andrew. He, he got it a little bit more than the average other apostles. He was already a disciple to one of the great rabbis out there. John the Baptist would have been known as a prophet slash rabbi walking around. He would have encountered some circles of students learning. He would have found spectacular students who, I've said this before, if you just raised your hand and had the answer, that's not a good education. That's just memorizing what your teacher wants to tell you, assuming teachers are know-alls. Not even the rabbis were know-alls. So great students don't just memorize the answer to please a teacher. Great students, when asked a question, answer with asking another question. And then the teacher would ask another question back. And the student would ask another question back, never giving direct answers. And it just literally filtered down to the bare minimum of knowledge the very foundation and origins. And so John the Baptist would have walked around, and Andrew must have been good at that because he was a John the Baptist disciple. John the Baptist would have said to him, you, come and follow me. And he got up and did. And you can read some of the other stories about the conversion of Andrew. It's a pretty cool story where Andrew runs, and he actually reaches his brother, Peter. Peter's considered, the, if you will, the head apostle. Andrew's the one who reached him. You have no idea who you encounter or I encounter when we're out in society. We can make an impact in a student's life. We can make an impact in somebody who's 100 years old. And you have no idea what they might do the next day or who they might be. The importance of you and I to go out into the world and be salt and light. You never know. Somebody had to reach Billy Graham. Somebody had to reach Moody. Somebody had to reach some of these greats out there that have world impact. Don't just think you're somebody just average that doesn't have an impact. You have no idea who God might have cross your path. And it's why in the vision of what we've talked about of Christ Church that we love people so much, we will, we will open our eyes to anybody around us. We love people so much, we'll serve anybody in our line of sight who's hungry, lonely, thirsty, has a shattered life, or anybody who's in need. Be the one who stops and serves them. And you never know who you might encounter. So you look at Andrew. He was, a, he was a John the Baptist disciple. He won Peter to Jesus himself. Uh, he's the one, Andrew's the one, who brought the lad with five loaves and two fish to Jesus. Uh, these are some things I found myself, if it came to trivia, I was a little rusty as I was putting this together. As to the 12 apostles, can you go down the list? Could you memorize who they are? That, that won't have any real life change impact on you, but sometimes it's good to know those, especially if you're playing Bible trivia, which you'll never do the rest of your life. So I'm not sure some of this is valuable, but it's interesting sometimes to pause. Oh, that was Andrew. How'd Andrew die? Now, we don't know this for a fact. 
But I've found as we've traveled, I've traveled to, to uh, Israel three different times that church tradition, there's some tradition, word of mouth, that we may not find in books or other places, but word of mouth that verifies some things. And the word of mouth over the last 2,000 years still carries very strong. And the way I learned this is the argument between two sites in Jerusalem where they think Jesus, one of them is for sure where he was crucified, where the empty tomb is. There's two locations. They're both exactly one mile from the location of where he was whipped. He, you're not allowed to carry thing in the Roman Empire for more than a mile. And, and so one of those locations in word of mouth and tradition is probably the most accurate one. So tradition says for Andrew that in Russia, just if we're thinking location, call it what you want, he was crucified by a cannibal tribe is what word of mouth says. Terrible. Crucified by a tribe of cannibals is what they say is how Andrew died just simply doing what you and I are doing, living in the world, sharing the good news of Jesus. They killed him and potentially Ate him. Let's take a look at the Apostle Bartholomew. Bartholomew also is known as Nathaniel in scriptures in the Bible. Many times there's multiple names. There's only seven verses about him in the Bible. Poor guy. Let's read them. Some of these that are really obscure, I just wanted to read them for fun. If you look at John chapter 1, I'll read it for you, verses 45 through 51. Here's the story. Philip went to look for Nathaniel, also known as Bartholomew. They're calling him Nathaniel here. And told him, we have, found, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, he says, and you can tell there's a little sarcasm in this Bartholomew. Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? This guy's showing a little bit of a bias, maybe a little racial spirit going on there towards a certain town. Maybe it was a local sports rival. I don't know what it was, but nothing good coming out of Nazareth in his mind. And I love the next sentence. Philip says to him, come and see. Come and see. I'm convinced the greatest thing that you can do in your life is to not get so caught up in telling people about Jesus, but get into their life and let them come and see you. Just let them watch your life, how you live, how you behave. Invite them to church. Come and see. You know, it's pretty powerful in this. Worked, it worked for Bartholomew. Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. And as they approached, Jesus said, Now here's a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. I'll bet that caught Bartholomew off. He's like, what? How do you know about me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip even found you. Ooh, that would have caught him off guard again. Then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. And Jesus asked him, Do you believe this just because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You'll see greater things than this. Yeah, he sure will. And then he said, I tell you the truth. You will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who, who is the stairway between heaven and earth. Beautiful story there just about him. How did he die? Ah, listen to this. Seven verses about him. He was in India, and they say he was flayed. You know what that means? You ever flayed a fish? And I've read about this because I just am weird about some of the things I read. They tie you up to a pole knowing that if you pass out, you're still tied. You don't fall. And they begin to literally remove your skin from your body while you're awake. If you pass out, they pause. They wait for you to come back to. And then they begin to flay your skin again. Miserable, terrible death. Wouldn't you think that if Jesus was a fake that if he really didn't raise from the dead, as some say that these 12 apostles went around the world and just kept a secret, it was all a fake just for fame, don't you think in the middle of being filleted alive, you would say, it's a fake, I've made it all up, I cave in. No, it's crazy. It takes my breath away to think about what these guys have done for Jesus and how quick we are, even speaking of myself, to be lazy in the kingdom of heaven and to demand only what I want. When I read about these stories, it humbles me greatly. We're going to meet these people. It is in your future that you will meet these men of God. And there will be stories shared about what they did for the kingdom of heaven and what they were willing to sacrifice. 
And there might be a moment where I get a chance to speak, and I'm going to feel like a total idiot if I don't get with the program. Compared to what these guys have done, we have so much work we can do. We have freedom. Imagine these guys. They did everything they did under the threat of death. We have total freedom to do or say whatever we want. And oh, we sometimes get so bashful. Don't say that to make us feel guilty. I say it to convict us. We can do better, can't we? Can you? I know I can. So let's look at James, son of Alphaeus. He's known as James the Less or James the Little. Uh, there's no biblical recording of him. Some say that's why he's called or nicknamed James the Less. Some tradition says, no, he's just short. Seriously, as I did some reading and study, and it says, no, he was considered a short man, so they called him James the Less or James the Little. And so we know nothing of him other than in Spain, there's a debate, it might be in Syria, that he was stoned to death and, or stoned and did not die, and so they finished him off with clubs. I don't know if you know stoning. Sometimes we think of it from, we've seen it in the Muslim culture where they just put you and they throw rocks. It's not the original way they did it in, in the Jewish Israel. They would find a cliff if there was one available. And they would throw you down the cliff and then throw huge stones down at you if the, if the impact of the cliff didn't kill you. And they say that this is the case. It did not kill him. They went down with clubs and finished him off. James the less. How about the other apostle James? son of Zebedee. They call him James uh, the Great. He was one of the brothers known as the Sons of Thunder. James the Great because when you're reading through the Gospels, on occasion you'll come across uh, the inner circle and it says Peter, James, and John went with Jesus. There was those three. So he gets nicknamed James the Great. All right, Not James the writer of James. This is a different one. James, the writer, was a half-brother to Jesus, did not believe Jesus to be the Messiah while Jesus was alive. It was only till after his death that James, his half-brother, or his brother, chose and made the decision, Jesus truly is the Messiah. I saw him raised from the dead, and we get the letter from James. And so the inner circle here is James the Great. He's the second martyr. Uh, I'm not going to read it. Well, let's do Acts chapter 2. Don't be lazy. Acts chapter 2, 12, sorry, verse 2. Here's the story. The second martyr. Anybody up good in Bible trivia? Who's the first martyr of the faith? Stephen. Yep. 12.2. Uh, about that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute believers in the church. It's happening in China a lot right now. A lot of people dying for their faith in Christ today as we speak. He had the apostle James. That's John's brother. Sons of thunder. I don't know if they had anger, if they were loud, deep voices. We don't know the real reasons, but, you know, maybe he had a little bit of anger issues. He had the apostle James, John's his brother, killed with the sword. And when Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. And this took place during the Passover celebration. He imprisoned him, placed him under guard, and the story goes on. So, as you look at this story uh, he's the second guy to die for the faith, to die for Jesus. He's John's brother, and he's beheaded by sword. Lost his head, literally, for the faith. His brother, let's take a look at the apostle John. John is the youngest of the apostles. John is the one who writes of himself. It always kind of cracks me up. The one whom Jesus loved. You know, and, and nobody else refers to him that way, but John does of, him, of himself. I don't know what that says about him, but it's all fun. He is also a disciple of John the Baptist. He's the writer of John and the book of Revelation. All right, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. He's also the one whom Jesus loved. I said that. And he's the only one of the apostles who did not die uh, a martyr's death. He died of old age, they say, on the island of Patmos where he was left alone, imprisoned there, and wrote the book of Revelation that some say is what helped the Christian church and the Jewish people of the day uh, due to what happened in 70 AD, the absolutely wiping out of Christians and Jews. They say 11 to 13 million Christians and Jews were murdered by the Roman Empire. Some say... It's one of the theories of what most of the book of Revelation is about. 
is written in code because if John just writes, hey, straight up, the Roman Empire is coming into Jerusalem. Here's the seven leaders of the Roman Empire that are going to come in, and they're literally going to destroy the temple. Uh, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, has warned me of this. If he would have said it, the letter would have never got through the Roman guard, which would have got it out to the people. So he had to say, hey, the dragon with the seven heads is going to come in, and this is what's going to happen, and there's going to be this and that. And then somebody with the gifts of tongues would have been able to translate it, or an interpreter, maybe gifts of interpretation, would have been able to interpret that with the help of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the theories. There's so much argument and discussion about the book of Revelation. One of them has to do, it says, it's, it's, it's called a modified praetorist view that says the book of Revelation, except the last three chapters, has nothing to do with the end times. It was to save Christians and Jews from being completely wiped off the map around the year 70 A.D., when all of Jerusalem was completely raised. It was, even Jesus predicted that in, in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. But I, I don't know which one, so don't argue about the book of Revelation. Just know this, Jesus is coming back someday. Be ready. Who cares when, how, what? Just be a friend of Jesus. Honor the Lord. And you don't have to worry about the end times. You can't control it anyway. And none of it. If you ever hear a preacher stepping up and saying, let me tell you exactly what the book of Revelation is about, red flag, there's probably six or seven views as the book of Revelation. Be careful being so confident that you know what it is. All right, that's the Apostle John, youngest of the bunch, the last to die, died of old age. Let's take a look at this wonderful fella. Judas Iscariot. He was the treasurer to the apostles. I think this is interesting. Let's read just a little bit of this, and we're literally about to wrap it up. John uh, chapter 12. Verse 6. Let me get there. Uh, but Judas Iscariot, I'll jump up to verse 4. But Judas Iscariot, the, does, the disciple who would soon betray Jesus, this is that young John writing this again, the one whom Jesus loved, it, who would soon betray Jesus, said this, That perfume, that was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Listen to John's snide remark here. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. He just threw Judas right under the bus. And it's fascinating when you read Scripture from that perspective? Just a little bit of a different perspective right there. We'll keep going through this. Uh, Jesus calls him a devil. I'm in John 11. Let me go back to John chapter 6. This is not a good day for Judas. Chapter 6, verse 70 says, Then Jesus said, I chose the 12 of you, but one of you is a devil. Crazy. He was speaking of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, one of the 12 who would later betray him. So I say this with a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. It does not, well, it matters to you eternally. But it does not matter to God if you choose not to believe in him or not. I mean, he loves you. He knows what's good for you. He, he knows your life would be so much better with him in it. But if you choose to not honor or be used by the Lord, you will still be used by the Lord. I mean, Judas, straight up, says he was a devil. Says he was going to betray him. Didn't believe in him fully to be who he said he was. Jesus still completely used him. You have a choice in how you can be used by the Lord. For good or for good choice or to just be used by the almighty Lord who created the sun, the moon, and the stars. And if you choose not to believe in him, he's going to use you in some way or form anyway to accomplish his purpose. I just choose to say, I'm all in, Lord. Use me however you want. I don't like that other side, that even though he was declared a devil, Jesus used him to accomplish one of the most important things that the world needed, salvation, to pay the price of sin for all mankind. Judas was a critical player in that, even though he didn't choose to believe Jesus to be Lord at the time. Now, when you think of Ju Judas, you keep going through. I mean, greet one another with a holy kiss, the Bible says. That's how they greeted each other. This kiss had a whole different perspective on the cheek. Totally betrayal, you know. And later, it caught up with him. Suicide. Judas could have been saved through all of that. All he had to do, I mean, he did show one little bit of repentance. 
He showed the guilt and he recognized what he, he had done. He had taken those 30 pieces of silver and he'd thrown them back. And there, there's a poem about it. Let me read it. 30 pieces of silver for the Lord of life they gave. 30 pieces of silver, only the price, really, of a slave. But this was the priestly value of the Holy One of God. And they weighed it out in the temple, the price of his precious blood. 30 pieces of silver laid in Iscariot's hand. 30 pieces of silver and the aid of an armed band. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter brought the humble Son of God at midnight from the garden where his sweat had been like blood. 30 pieces of silver burns on the traitor's brain. 30 pieces of silver, oh, it's a hellish gain. I have sinned and betrayed the guiltless, he cried with a lowered breath, and he threw them down in the temple and rushed to a madman's death. All he had to do, he threw the 30 silver coins back, and instead of running to a suicide death, all he had to do was run to Jesus and fall at his feet. He'd already been betrayed. He was already prepared to be crucified. All he had to do was repent. 1 John 1, 9 says, God's faithful. All you have to do is confess your sins. He's faithful and just, and he will forgive you of your sins. He chose to go out the route of suicide. He should have just shown up at the foot of the cross and said, I made a huge mistake, and he'd been good. God's that good. God's that patient. God's that kind. No matter what you've done, all he's waiting for is for your heart to be broken, to go before him, get on your knees. You don't even have to get on your knees. You know what I mean? And show humility and say, I'm so sorry. I've sinned. I fall short of your glory. Forgive me. And it's done. That is a good, loving, kind, amazing God. Judas was that close. He was that close. Uh, a few more here. We'll wrap them up. Apostle Matthew. He's the one who's the tax collector. Terrible person to be. They were considered lower in ranking of sin than prostitution. A tax collector. Uh, he's the gospel writer. It's interesting. The main theme of all of Matthew is righteousness. This guy was awful in his life, B.C., before Christ. And then he gave his life to Christ, and he's the one writing about righteousness for the Lord Jesus Christ. They say he is uh, beheaded in Ethiopia. These guys scattered all around the world, didn't they? You know, absolutely amazing how they were empowered. At the crucifixion, waiting while he was buried, they were hidden, scared as little kids after watching a horror story, in a house, waiting, wondering what was going to happen to them. And then he rose from the dead. And they found a boldness that was willing to have them be filleted, beheaded, crucified upside down. That's Peter. Let's get to him. The apostle Peter, he was a fisherman. Peter, we, he gets a bad rap, but he did actually walk on water, even if it was for a brief moment. Don't pick on him so much. He got out of the boat. He's amazing. I love that story. Jesus was denied by him three times. I say this, bear with me. There's a sermon coming up in the near future where I'm going to show you a mistranslation in the scriptures. Very clearly shows that Peter's not the first pope, that that's just not the direction. I grew up with Catholic roots. I have a reverence for the Catholic faith, but there's some misunderstanding. It's stuck in the Old Testament where there's a hierarchical pyramid of priesthood. The New Testament comes in, and Jesus clearly declares a priesthood of all believers, all believers. And it's very important that you have a personal, relational, friendship connection with Jesus. You do not need to go through another man. Now, the Bible says it's good. Confess your sins to one another. That's called just having community and humility and vulnerability, sharing our junk in our trunk, being real with one another. And I pray that you're doing that as our, as our life groups get connected. And if you want to get into life groups, sign up. Use that connection card. Write life group. Keith will call you and get you plugged into one that works for you. If you don't know which one you want to be in, talk to him. Keith's awesome with following up with that. Peter did become the leader of the apostles. And they say, the story says that when they went to crucify him, that they went to put him on a regular cross and he demanded that he's not worthy to be crucified in the same way his Lord was. Turn me upside down. And they say they turned him upside down and crucified him. The Apostle Philip, kind of obscure. We don't know a lot about him. What we do is not good. He has, he has a Gentile name. 
which is strange. There's a story behind that. I don't know how. I don't know why. That means he would have faced rejection among some of the Jews. Uh, we don't know anything else other than that. It, it says, as I did a little scripture study, John 14, verse 8, it says he's a bit dull. You, you decide for yourself. Uh, so if you tell me afterwards, hey, Trent, I kind of I kind of relate with Philip. That let me know about you a little bit. John 14, 8 says this. And let me put it into con on the context. Jesus is talking to the guys. And he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? I don't know if he read it with that tone of voice, but I would have, right? And so it says he was a bit dull. You decide for yourself. How was he martyred? It says he was crucified in Asia, in a city called Phrygia. Apostle Simon, this one's interesting to me. If you know me at all, I kind of am attracted to the rebel. Uh, a zealot. What's a zealot? Simon the Zealot, they call him. A zealot is somebody who's an extreme Pharisee. What's the word I use? Ultimate Pharisee patriot. Ultra, ultimate Pharisee patriot. Meaning this guy, he really believed Jesus was going to be the new king of Israel, literally. And that when his day declared he would call a war, they would nail the Roman Empire and make Israel one again, its own, a sovereign nation, not under the realm or the umbrella of the Roman Empire. And Simon, if he is what I think he is, I think this makes him what's called a Sakari Jew. It means he would have dressed, and you see the wardrobe, it's got extra clothes, and this was a very normal attire for many of them in that time. He would carry a sword, a knife, about this long, a curve, it's got a curved blade, and it would hide perfectly in that sash that he's wearing. And when the big senators and the troublemakers and the politicians and the people that were preventing Israel from becoming a sovereign nation, he would walk into the crowd just as a regular believer. He'd wait for a big crowd. And then as the senator or whoever he was going to, he would reach in and grab that Sakari sword, that knife. He would walk in, boom, right into the lungs, through the ribs, put the knife back, and then be, oh, my gosh, something's happened. And would totally, nobody knew it was him, you know. Kind of a cool person, I got to admit. <laughs> I, I guess I have a little evil in me or something. But Simon the Zealot, a go-getter, he's an assassin. Jesus picked this guy to be one of his disciples, Tell me again that you're not worthy to follow the Lord? Come on. When's the last time you pulled out your sword and punctured somebody lo somebody's lung and then faked it and called 911 and was there when the ambulance showed up? So I don't know what happened. I just saw him fall before me. That's who Jesus picked. There's nothing else about his life biblically recorded. I don't know why. It says in the scripture that if everything would have been recorded that Jesus had done, all the libraries in the world would not be able to hold all the books. We know so little, but what we know is just enough. And they say he was crucified in Syria. Still a lot of trouble going on in Syria, isn't there? Isn't that fascinating? Let's wrap this up. I think we're getting close here. The Apostle Thaddeus, a.k.a. also, this guy had three names. Some say four. His name is also Judas, not Judas Iscariot. This is the good Judas. Or Labaius, however you say that. Labius, I don't know. He's the one who asked Jesus a question. Let me get there quickly. Some of you are yawning. I get this. This is like a classroom sermon. This one's not fun for me either, but different. Kind of interesting. John 14, starting with verse 19, says this. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, Jesus says. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each one of them. And Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the one disciple with the name, said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? And Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them. He goes on, that's, that's all we get. He just asked Jesus a question. Weird, one of the 12, and we know very little about him. They say he was beaten to death in Mesopotamia. The apostle Thomas, you guys counting? I've lost count. I feel like we're going on forever here. The apostle Thomas, also nicknamed Doubting Thomas. Some say, 
And I, I've been through Bible college, have a master's degree. I'd never heard this one, but, but it makes sense. It's right there in Scripture. Isn't it funny how you read through and you miss some things? It says, it says Thomas Didymus, which means the twin. I'd never taken the time to read what does Didymus mean. Some say he might have been, uh, I jumped out here. Somebody may have to help me. Uh, he's the twin to Matthew. I don't know what the next point is. Let's go back to it. Maybe you can do this. I'm talking to myself. Can somebody get me back in there? Uh, come on, John eleven sixteen. We'll read that. It says this. I'm right there. Thomas, nicknamed the twin. I don't know how I never, I, I've read the Bible cover to cover so many times. I just never thought that or saw that. Uh, what's the verse? 16. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, this shows his heart. Let's go to, let's go to Jerusalem and die with him. I can like this guy. I like this guy. Let's go to the rest. With John 14, 5, let me go back and read these real quick. John 14, 5 says, uh, and Jesus is saying, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in me. There's no, there's not, there, is, there is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare. I would not have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And that's what Jesus is doing, preparing a place for you in eternity. Don't fully get it, but we're going to know someday. I'll come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am, and you will know the way to where I'm going. And this guy, Thomas, says, no, we don't know, Lord. We have no idea where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way and the truth and the life. And it goes on. Pretty cool that way. Uh, John 20, verse 24. Let's get close to wrapping this up. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. And they told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Well, eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing amongst them. I love to scare people, too. I'm like Jesus. It's fun in the office. If you come in the office, I will try to scare you, I promise. Put your finger here, he says to Thomas, and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed, and he became a believer. They say he died in India. Uh, keep going. Does it say how? Did I put it in there? He was spared to death. But they say, tradition says, he went and found the three wise men who showed up at Jesus' birth. This is just tradition, not in the Bible. And that he converted them and taught them that Jesus really was the Messiah, told them the rest of the story that he rose from the dead. And India today has believers because of the Apostle Thomas and the three wise men going and sharing the good news of Christ. Don't know if it's truth or not, part of tradition. Let's keep rolling to the next one. Please, let's be done. The Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, click the next one. He's not one of the original 12, all right? Saul walked around and was an absolute Pharisee. He was a Pharisee that walked around and was a very important one because at the stoning of Stephen, Paul is the one whom they laid their clothes down before his feet as a way of, may I have permission to kill this man? And Paul would be there saying, I give you permission. And they would pick up stones and go kill the guy they were going to kill. That's Paul. He oversaw the death of Christians. Keep rolling. He wrote 12 of 27. Some say he also wrote Hebrews. We don't know that for a fact. But so if he did, he wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. He was a murderer of Christians before he came to know Christ, and he was beheaded for his faith in Rome. Let's hit the next slide and call it quits. I'm not going to read 10, 1 through 10 again. Let's close in prayer. The 12 gave everything. The 12 apostles and the 13th with Paul, they gave everything. So ask the question, what do I need to do to grow in my next step with Christ? I'm not even close to giving my life for Jesus, and I know you are not either. What do I need to do in my next step to say I will be more faithful? And all God's people said...